the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. He is in our In today's uh, epistle, the Apostle Paul, in his very short epistle, speaks a, a word that he says is worthy of all saying and reception. He uses this phraseology to, to say that it's a, a word of it that we should accept. In other words, it almost was like a hymn that we could sing and remind ourselves that Christ came into the world sinner, uh, to save sinners, of whom I am first, he says. Now the context of this epistle passage, before he writes that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am first, he takes the time to talk about his former life persecuting Christianity. He talks about being a stubborn man. He talks about being uh, zealous. And if you can go back and remember uh, St. Augustine in his commentary, talking about the sinfulness of Paul, says that Paul wasn't satisfied to see Stephen condemned, but he needed many people to condemn him, so he offered himself to hold their coats as he watched Stephen get stoned to death. He dragged many people to prison. He persecuted the church until essentially that revelation on the road to Damascus and Paul is aware that he was completely ignorant, that he didn't deserve Christ, and that he wasn't looking for Christ. He acknowledges the reality that Christ came to him, and that whatever blessings he had, whatever forgiveness he had, had nothing to do with him. So today, that's the context, but today he says, this is a faithful and worthy saying that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. But we have to note, uh, transitionally, that Paul is not saying that he was a sinner. Although the context, he goes through his various sins, he doesn't say, I was a sinner. He says, I am a sinner. And this is the same apostle who is speaking to Timothy, who founded the churches, who wrote 13 of the epistles, who spread the gospel throughout the Mediterranean. So this leaves us with a little bit of a, a perplexed mind. And, and one particular scholar I read, obviously that he is being hyperbolic, Paul, when he says he's a sinner. He's obviously over-speaking, kind of a feigned humility. He says, oh, I'm a sinner, and you're a sinner. And actually, this, this one scholar I read actually condemns Paul. He says, this is very unlike Paul. Usually, he's so sincere. Usually, he really speaks what's on his mind. But at this time, he says that he's a sinner. Because we know better. Paul's not a sinner. He's a saint. He's an apostle. He's done all these works. And we also know clearly that he's not saying, I was a sinner. The language in Greek is emphatic. I am a sinner, of whom I am chief. It's a current proposition. Paul sees himself as a sinner. And this perplexes many people, but I would have you to note that Paul is simply being honest about himself, and that he sees himself for who he really is, and that although he may be conscious of all the works that God has accomplished through him, he is also very conscious of his own spiritual reality. What is the truth about Paul? He's a sinner. What is the truth about Paul? He's a saint. And these two are held in attention. Paul would never proclaim himself a saint, but in his humility and in his ability to see the truth, he can acknowledge that he is currently, as he writes the epistle, a sinner. Now this is a, a teaching for our lives. Paul's example is for us. Paul says it's a worthy and faithful saying that Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am chief, to give us an example, to say essentially that if God can save me, 
not only who was very corrupt and sinful and murderous and persecuted the church, an apostle born out of time, uh, least among the apostles. If, if Jesus Christ can save that Paul, if Jesus Christ can save the apostle who writes these letters but is yet a sinner, then what more does he have for the rest of us? And we're meant actually to draw this comparison that if God can save Paul, he can save anyone essentially. And so when we think about our own spiritual lives, it behooves us to recognize that there are certain feelings that come along with being a Christian. I was talking to someone recently, I don't remember who, uh, not here, but of a different faith tradition, very confident, very confidently proclaiming their Christianity and telling the positive story of their prophetic witness while somehow completely missing their own sinfulness, completely glossing over it. They had a strong sense when you stood near them, a feeling of adequacy. They knew how the Spirit worked and they could tell the Spirit where to go and what to do, to convict, to lead, and they felt empowered by God. But what was missing from this was the acknowledgement of the reality of life. And so for us, it's actually good to point out that within our spirituality, if you ever feel inadequate, that you should feel inadequate. If you ever feel unworthy, you might be getting closer to God. If you ever feel like a failure, it might be a sign that you're on the right path. If you ever feel stupid and foolish, that you have repeatedly sinned the same way, that you've repeatedly asked forgiveness, that you repeatedly prayed for God to remove something from your life and it keeps coming up, that that too is part of the Christian faith. And that the results of the Christian faith are not necessarily a full sense of confidence and power, but are a sense of quiet and mournful joy. The sense of joy that the Apostle Paul points out, and we have to, again, pause and, and have another sidetracking caveat here. Paul is not sad about being the chief of sinners. Paul is not beating himself up. Paul does not have a negative self-image. Paul is not, woe is me, I'm the worst of sinners, oh my God. Who's going to save me? How could this happen? What was me? Paul is not dealing with self-pity and saturated with self-loathing and self-hatred like so many of us that within our society. When Paul speaks this, the next line of the epistle, he goes on and says that he marvels that what for him is not, he doesn't marvel at his sinfulness, he marvels at God's mercy. He marvels that Jesus Christ saves people like him. He marvels that even though he's currently a sinner and a broken person, that despite that, God looks through all that and sees his inherent value and dies on the cross for him and rises on the third day. That caveat's only important for those who are filled with self-hatred. Paul is also not proud of his sinfulness. On the other hand, he is not going out there and saying, showing his tattoos and saying, look at me, I'm so sinful, but Jesus is so merciful. <laughs> look at me, I can do anything I want, but God will save me. He's not on the opposite end of self-pity, where he braggadociously and presumptuously claims salvation despite his unworthiness. He marvels at the grace of God, and he marvels that God would save someone like him. So as we head on in our spiritual life, and especially those of these newly illumined marble family, as you head on in your spiritual journey, the church will teach you that you're supposed to go from glory to glory, but it doesn't always feel that glorious. 
Sometimes it feels like, like hell. Sometimes it feels like you don't know what you're doing, like you're empty, like God is pushing you over a cliff. The Christian faith, when we heard the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, is not about good, fuzzy feelings and about being happy all the time. If we live an authentic spiritual life, we will feel inadequate. And with the Apostle Paul, we should come to the point where we can marvel at the grace of God that despite our inadequacy, that God still loves us, that He still has done everything to save us, and that like the prodigal son, even though we may be the chief among sinners, the minute we turn back, He is waiting there for us. He is running out to meet us. And this is why we have joy. This is the message of the gospel. Sinners can be forgiven and made saints. And it's also a wondrous message that we don't have to deny the reality of ourselves. That we can tell the truth about ourselves. That I can stand up as a priest here and tell you that I am empty. And that you should be able to say, oh yeah, Father's just a Christian, he's just a good Christian. <laughs> I don't feel empty right now, but anyways, at some point I can tell that. May God bless us to emulate the Apostle Paul, to see ourselves as achieved among sinners in reality, and to marvel at the mystery of God's grace in the heavenly kingdom in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ is in our midst. Yeah.